Mr. President, it is Super Tuesday. Millions of Americans will vote in primaries in 16 different states. It's a day for Americans from all walks of life to express their political opinion and vote for the candidate they deem best suited for the highest office in the land. As Americans, our most fundamental right is the right to vote. My dear friend and colleague, the late Congressman John Lewis, called voting, and I quote, the most powerful, nonviolent tool we have to create a more perfect union. In our last presidential election, more than 158 million Americans cast a ballot, the largest voter turnout in the history of the United States. But that record doesn't tell the whole story. Over the weekend, the Brennan Center for Justice released a report on the growing racial disparities in voting in America. They found, and I quote, the racial turnout gap, the difference in the turnout rate between white and non-white voters, has consistently grown since 2012 and is growing most quickly in parts of the country that were previously covered under Section 5 of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which the Supreme Court of the United States suspended in its 2013 decision in Shelby County versus Holder. So although record numbers of Americans are making their voices heard in elections, we're also witnessing an explosion of sinister efforts to discourage and silence many of these voices. Unfortunately, efforts to suppress the right to vote in this country are nothing new. Congress took action in 1965 when the United States Senate voted 77 to 19 to pass the Voting Rights Act, finally outlawing state practices that had denied millions of Americans, especially black Americans, the right to vote. Over the next almost 50 years, the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized five times, always, always by large bipartisan majorities. Each new version expanded the promise and protection of the Voting Rights Act. The most recent was signed into law by Republican President George W. Bush in 2006. That all changed in 2013. The Supreme Court struck a deadly blow on the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County versus Holder. Before the court's ruling in Shelby County, the Voting Rights Act required localities with a track record of disenfranchising voters of color to seek federal approval for any changes in their voting laws. This requirement was known as pre-clearance and it could have blocked many of the restrictive voting provisions that we've seen since that Supreme Court decision in states like Georgia and Texas. In 2021, the Supreme Court weakened another critical section of the Voting Rights Act with a decision in a case known as Brnovich versus the Democratic National Committee, making it more difficult for plaintiffs to prevail in lawsuits against discriminatory voting laws, decisions, or procedures. With these rulings, the Supreme Court has fueled state-led efforts to suppress voters, particularly voters of color. Justice Elena Kagan wrote in her dissent in Brnovich, in the last decade, this court has treated no statute worse than the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This year's presidential election will be the first general election since a wave of restricted voting laws were passed in the aftermath of the 2020 election. Mr. President, did you ever take a look at the videos and reporting of people standing in line waiting to vote. Did you ever notice, coincidentally, how many of the people standing in line were people of color? Why there always seems to be a lack of voting spaces for people of color when it comes to voting. Why is that? Well, I don't think it's an accident. I think it's a conscious decision. And before the Holder decision, Shelby County Holder decision, there was a requirement for pre-clearance for the practices that lead to that. Voters in 27 states, more than half the country, will face re restrictions on the right to vote they've never experienced before because of this Supreme Court decision. Last year alone, state legislators in 14 states enacted 17 laws that made it harder for people, particularly people of color, to vote. As members of Congress, we must defend our democracy from these coordinated attacks on the fundamental right we have as Americans. Last week, a group of my colleagues and I reintroduced a bill bearing the name of John Lewis, whom I mentioned before. It'll preserve and protect the rights of voting, the right to vote in America. This legislation would restore and strengthen the Voting Rights Act. This bill honors the legacy of John Lewis and countless other Americans 
who have fought and some have died for the right to vote. Last Congress, we tried to bring this legislation to the floor for a debate and a vote, but our Republican colleagues blocked it with a filibuster. This bill would unite senators across the aisle, not, not divide them. In 2006, 98 senators, Republicans and Democrats alike, voted to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act with no votes in opposition. 2006, not that long ago, 98 senators voted to reauthorize this bill. At the time, Senator McConnell had just spoken to the floor and said, and I quote, this is a good piece of legislation, the Voting Rights Act, that has served an important purpose over many, many years. That was the bipartisan spirit which greeted that bill in 2006. Yet today, Senate Republicans have no interest in reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act to protect voters from efforts to suppress their right to vote. Next week, the Senate Judiciary Committee will hold a hearing to examine the continued need to restore and expand the protections of the Voting Rights Act. This hearing is an important step, but we desperately need legislation, not just a hearing. Every year that goes by without passing this critical law leaves voters vulnerable, particularly voters of color. That's why I'm calling on my colleagues to join me in supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that we're reintroducing. Congress has the power to restore voting rights, and we should do it. Because as John Lewis reminded us, democracy is not a state. It is an act, and each generation must do its part to help build what we call the beloved community, a nation and a world society at peace with itself. Mr. President, I yield the floor.